Welcome to Fast Forward. I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and we are on the CES show floor. This is a show where we have conversations about living in the future. I'm here with Don Butler, Director of Connected Vehicles and Services with Ford. We're at the Ford booth, and we're going to talk about self-driving cars. We're going to talk about the future of cities and the future of transportation, and all those things uh, interplay with one another. So, Don, thanks so much for taking the time here. Uh, your title is Director of Connected Vehicles and Services. Most people don't think about Ford as a services company, but it's really fundamental to Ford's approach to transportation, right? You're absolutely right, Dan. I mean, our vision is that we want to make people's lives better by changing the way the world moves. And in the past, that definition of making people's lives better was essentially affordable transportation, right? Going all the way back to the days of our founder, Henry Ford, and the Model T, the assembly line. And so it literally opened up the highways for all mankind. As we fast forward 113 years, right, obviously some of the dynamics have changed. Cities are becoming more congested. We're more concerned, obviously, about environment and making sure that we can be compatible with what's happening in terms of um, global warming. So we're really thinking about our business and our company, not just as an automotive business, but as a mobility business as well. And that sense of mobility also has a sense of software and services related to being mobile. And so my title, Connected Vehicle and Services, speaks to the underlying technology in terms of what it takes to connect the vehicle, what it takes to enable some of that capability, but also the services that we'll be delivering as a result of that, moving from not just an ownership profile, but to usership and shared models as well. So services absolutely is part of what we'll be about. And you're very focused on, you were one of the first companies to really look at transportation as a, not just as a service, but as a platform. That you were going to build the cars, but you really need to build an ecosystem around that that brought in lots of different partners. Right. Sync was sort of the beginning of that. And then as it's evolved, you've, got, you've just been lining up more and more partners to expand what the, uh, what the platform can do. You're, you're Talk absolutely Talk about some of those new partners. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and that notion of platform is spot on because it's not just single purpose, let me get from A to B. Certainly we want to still do great hardware. We do great hardware, right? Things that are great to look at, great to sit in, and great to drive. But this notion of a platform as well, and Sync is an absolutely ideal way of doing that because number one, it recognizes that the smartphone has become essentially the way that we organize our lives, the way that we entertain ourselves, the way that we communicate, the way that we stay in touch. And as a platform, it's ideally designed for that, particularly with AppLink, which is the linking technology that we have that would enable you to take advantage of the content, the applications that are on that smartphone. And it opens the door to developers as partners. And one of the partners that we're happy to work with um, and we're featuring at CES this year is Amazon. And so we're bringing the capability of Alexa into the vehicle, leveraging Sync AppLink as that platform and enabling people to, again, accomplish things more than just going from A to B, accomplishing those other kinds of experiences that they'd like to have while they're moving. So what kind of experiences, what does bringing Alexa inside the car do for the consumer? So imagine all the things that you could do at home with Alexa, like checking the weather, checking your schedule, checking your calendar, adding to your shopping list. We spend, most of us, an inordinate amount of time either commuting or inside our vehicles. And why should you be restricted from engaging with uh, that network, engaging with Alexa while you're inside the vehicle? So you can check your contacts, you can check your calendar, you can add to your shopping list. And one of the interesting things that we've done to sort of integrate the vehicle-related aspects of that, you could say, for instance, Alexa, what are some of the restaurants that are nearby? Mm -hmm. Come back with a list. After you go through a couple of queries, you nail down the restaurant that you'd like to go through. All this done through voice, by the way. That destination would immediately then be populated within our embedded navigation system on board the vehicle, which would then obviously take you there very seamlessly. Yep. So you don't have to build a voice interface. People are already familiar with Alexa. They've got the service. They've got the tools. But you can take it and expand on it. Exactly. You've also been very aggressive in partnering with other hardware vendors. Like you've got a relationship with Toyota uh, to help build out this platform as well. That's, that's something a lot of car companies wouldn't do. If we think about the technology space and we think about what makes sense, open platforms, open source platforms, things that make the common underlying technology just more accessible and more available and don't really, it's not really a point of differentiation. The differentiation is in the experience that you deliver. It's in the look and feel that's associated with your particular vehicle, your particular brand. 
And because we wanted to build this ecosystem, we open sourced AppLink, which is our linking technology, and it's called Smart Device Link. So Smart Device Link is the open source version of AppLink, and we were fortunate that Toyota shared our same perspective in terms of this open platform, making it more accessible, and we recently announced also at CES that we're forming a consortium, the Smart Device Link Consortium. Toyota and Ford are founding members, along with Mazda, Suzuki, Subaru, and PSA from France. We believe it's going to enable, again, a more accessible ecosystem, something that developers, I think, would be attracted to. And I'd, I'd like to distinguish what we're doing with Smart Device Link from CarPlay and Android Auto, for instance, because that's a question that would immediately come to mind, right? Those are linking technologies. Why don't you just let Apple and Google do it? And from a Ford perspective, we want to provide choice to our customers, so we do offer CarPlay. We do offer Android Auto. But if you think about those environments, a really good example, and it's not to be critical, it's just to describe how it is, you can't use Google Maps within CarPlay for obvious reasons, right? And vice versa, there's no Apple Maps within Android Auto. We want to be accessible and open to everyone. So we're open to all mapping providers with Smart Device Link. We're open to all application providers, provided again that they abide by what we have in terms of you know, things like driver distraction guidelines and yep. those sorts of things, but Smart Device Link provides a more open, accessible platform. It provides the developer more freedom, more control, working within a, a Ford look and feel or a Toyota look and feel, yep. so the manufacturer can get the distinction that they want, the developer can get the access that they want, Best of all, customers can get the experience that they want. Yeah, choice is always better. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about self-driving cars. Uh, we've been, I'm coming to the show, we've been talking for a number of years. It's always been something that's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. As an industry insider, are you surprised at how fast this has evolved and how quickly these cars have actually started to get on the road? I think it's incredible the extent to which the technology has developed and the extent to which we are demonstrating autonomous capability in our vehicles today. If, if we take a look at, and it's blocked by the crowds because it's very popular right now, but that vehicle behind us is our next generation autonomous vehicle. And one of the interesting developments there is we've taken the LiDAR that we sourced from Velodyne. In the past, actually in the early, early days, these were huge, huge units yeah. on top of the vehicle, right? And that's From how everybody knew they were on the street. Exactly. They, they stood yeah. out, and you couldn't miss it if it rolled, oh, if it rolled down You're the street. You're exactly right. And now, it's the size, maybe a little bit more, but about the size of a hockey puck, right? It's got greater range, it's got greater capability, and so instead of our, our previous generation autonomous vehicle, which had four somewhat large sensors, now we've got two sensors, 360 degree field of view, stereoscopically scanning the landscape, and the technology and the capability from the sensing standpoint has advanced incredibly. Also the technology from the thinking standpoint, so processing all that sensing information and then determining what do I want to tell the vehicle to do, that's advanced by leaps and bounds as well with GPU processors and just the ability that we have to do that sophisticated thinking in a much smaller scale. And then finally, the responding technology. So once we decide where the vehicle needs to go, the sensors and the actuators that actually steer and brake and use the throttle, when you think about things like steer by wire, brake by wire, and throttle by wire, those have advanced as well. And everything's kind of coming together so that we've got really, truly demonstrable platforms that we can experiment with. Now, we're still some time away from making this truly something that can operate in, in Ford's case in a level four manner within, a, within a, a, a known geospatial area where we've got high definition mapping. But we're certainly well on the path to achieving that. And getting back to your original question, I, I'm somewhat blown away actually by how far the technology has advanced. So you, you've, you mentioned level four. Uh, that's been key to your, miss, your mission. Let's just explain the difference between level three and level four sure. and why you, Ford is really saying Betting, placing a big bet on level four and saying we got to get to level four almost and, and not have these intermediate steps. Yeah, so not to get too detailed, but the difference between level three and level four, level three is some autonomous capability in some conditions, but it will require the driver to essentially remain attentive and be able to take control at any point. Level four. Which most people seem, seems like a good idea. It seems like a good idea on the surface. Level four for us, and the way it's described, within a known geographic bounded area where we've got high definition mapping, 
the vehicle is capable of fully autonomous infra, um, operation without the need for any human engagement at all. One of the challenges that we see with level three is depending on the situation, how do you, in a very potentially urgent manner, get the, the person, the occupant, to take control again? What's the indication that you use? Because we think what, what you know, I, I think just human nature, what's going to happen, if you're accustomed to the dr vehicle driving itself, then your attentiveness is probably not going to be on the road or on the particular situation. And so we just don't know how that handoff can be done effectively and in a safe manner. So all of our efforts are geared towards, number one, making sure that we've got high definition mapping in the areas where we will be operating autonomously. And then number two, making sure that we can operate autonomously 100% of the time. So that means from a sensing standpoint, from a thinking standpoint, as well as from a res responding standpoint. So having things like redundant steering, redundant throttle, redundant braking, so that it, if something happens, there's always a backup. We just think it's better if there's not the need for the driver to re-engage because we just we can think of so many scenarios where it would be really problematic. We've distracted driving problems now when you're supposed to be giving 100% of your attention to the road and to your driving. If you take it down to 60%, all of a sudden you're going to be reading books. Right. And, um, and we've already had a few of the uh, accidents that have happened so far have been in that gray area between the user and the car and not knowing who's supposed to take over. Right. When you talk about mapping, most people think about mapping as a once a year mapping, Google Maps type of process. but. You've actually got cars, so they've got LiDAR running, they're creating constant maps, exactly. like perpetual maps of, of the real-time terrain. You're right. That's something that, it's a whole new way of looking at mapping in, in transportation. It's a whole new way of looking at mapping, and these are, these are um, actually we call them dark maps um, when you look at the LiDAR patterns that are developed as a result of it, but they are high-density maps, okay. not only of the roadways, but of everything around the road and everything in the immediate proximity updated on a constant basis and looking at sort of differential patterns to understand what's changed and what's different. And in fact, we've been able to demonstrate the fact that we can operate autonomously on snow-covered roads, for instance, where camera vision systems would be everything highly gets problematic. Whited, whited yeah, out. everything gets whited out. But because we've got a high definition map of the area, and because we've got LIDAR and precise positioning, we know where we are without essentially having the cameras seeing where we are. So that's one of the reasons from a forward perspective, we think the three levels of sensing technology are absolutely critical. So radar, vision, and LIDAR, we think, make the complete package for autonomous. Let's talk about a little bit about how cities are gonna change with these new technologies. People talked about just the landscapes, the physical landscapes of cities being transformed by the introduction of these vehicles. Can you just talk a little bit about how you see that happening? So those are, that's one of the areas that we actually need to explore in hand in hand with cities. And we've actually created a group within Ford that's all around cities as partners. Because one of the things that we want to do is not be presumptuous and say, hey, we're coming in with the autonomous vehicle and here's what we think you need and you just need to adapt. We really want to understand from the city's perspectives, what are the challenges that you are facing? You know, what are the roadblocks, no pun intended, mm -hmm. that you're encountering as you plan for the future? Yeah. And then trying to understand how might we help you overcome some of those barriers. So if it's a city like London, for instance, and the congestion that happens in the city center and much of that congestion due to potentially commercial vehicle deliveries, for instance, might we look at some sort of hub and spoke kind of approach where the commercial vehicle comes to a certain place, but then you take an autonomous vehicle to route more precisely into the city centers, for instance. So what we're trying to do is explore those areas with cities in partnership to understand how might we, as we're developing our autonomous capability, help you with some of the problems that you're facing. We talk about autonomous cars. Most people think about a car they're going to own, they're going to park in their driveway, they're going to get in and it's going to take them to work and then take them home again. But it could be that a lot, the first wave of autonomous vehicles are sh shared vehicles or commercial vehicles or working on established routes, replacing buses, per se. Well, you, in, the, in the case of Ford, you're exactly right. Our first autonomous vehicles will be um, in a sense company owned and they will be used for ride sharing services and for commercial purposes, robotic taxis mm -hmm. if you will. One of the challenges is while the, the transportation at some point will be affordable, these first models will be let's just say expensive for an individual right. to own. 
But if they're operated as part of a ride sharing service, for instance, and if they've got really, really high utility, then we can bring that service to consumers, to businesses, and make it much, much more affordable than even personal ownership on a, on a, on a cost per mile kind of basis. And so, at least initially, our focus is on leveraging that for ride sharing services, for commercial services. We think that makes the most sense in terms of the transition that we see underway. Okay. So, two more questions. What are you, what is the biggest roadblock for the creation and widespread deployment of autonomous vehicles? Is it is it the, the intelligence? Is it the hardware? Is it the regula regulatory environment? What do you think is going to derail this? What's the biggest obstacle? I think from the, if, I, if I sort of divided it into three areas, sort of technology, society, regulatory, I think from the standpoint of the technology, we can see our way to delivering a vehicle within the next few years, as, as we have already um, projected. Like, like three? Like not, not 2021. 2021, okay. <laughs> Give me a little bit four. more time. Okay, you get yeah. four. <laughs> We can see our way th through that with the technology. Um, from a regulatory standpoint and from a societal standpoint, I think those are areas that we need to work most closely with thought leaders, with governmental bodies to make sure that from a regulatory standpoint, we can continue to test in a way that's most productive. So for instance, if we're going to move forward and in the case of our level four vehicle, we're saying there won't be a driver behind the wheel, right? Well, we're gonna need to test that scenario. Right now, essentially all the regulations require that there be a driver there, right? And so how can we work with the regulatory bodies to make sure that we can test in a way that makes sense? Absolutely being safe, absolutely making sure that we're doing it in a very um, thoughtful way, but nonetheless having the regulations and the guidelines, I guess, evolve so that we can move in that direction. And then from a societal standpoint, understanding, you know, in, in our case, right, it's going to be within known areas. and so going back to this notion of cities as partners, right? What cities make the most sense for initial deployment? What cities make the most sense in terms of some of the problems that they're encountering and how we could potentially help overcome those problems? And I think from the, from the standpoint of how we can benefit society, I think that's maybe an underappreciated element of what autonomous vehicles can do. A lot of people talk about safety and that's absolutely critical, absolutely the case, but there's broader benefit as well in terms of more efficiently moving goods and people from place to place. And so we think we absolutely play a role in that. And then it, in a sense, it all kind of circles back to making people's lives better by changing the way the world moves. So I know you've been trapped in the booth for a lot of this show. What are you most excited about on the show floor here? What technology do you think is gonna really transform society? And it can be transportation related or not. Yeah, I, I think I would maybe point to a couple of things that we've seen developing even last year. and and more so this year. Um, intelligent assistance, personal assistance, digital assistance like Alexa, for instance. I think you're gonna see much more prevalence of that, much more voice-based interaction, just because as technology advances and it becomes more complex, the simple way to interact is through voice, right? Not having to memorize a complicated menu structure, not having to understand displays and controls and how they work. It, it makes right? sense in the car and it makes sense at home, which is why Alexa took off. Absolutely right, absolutely right. And then when you couple with that, what's happening with virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, I think we can foresee a day, potentially in an autonomous mode, where you're being driven in a vehicle, right? You don't need to pay attention to the road, the vehicle's doing the driving for you. So all of a sudden, you can consume content and maybe consume that content in a very, very different way. Maybe you're actually participating in that meeting while you're driving and you're engaged and involved and from a mixed reality standpoint, people see you, you see them, you're able to interact and use your voice. And so I think all these things are kind of coming together to create a place that was maybe unimaginable even three or four years ago. Don, thanks so much for taking the time. If people want to know more about, about you and about Ford and, and the, the development of these technologies, where can they find more information about you? Just go to Ford.com and uh, you'll find more about what we're doing and the kinds of things that we're making uh, happen in the world today. Very cool. Thanks for taking the time. This has been Fast Forward with Dan Costo. I want to thank you for joining us. Let us know how we did in the comment section. We'll be back with more interviews soon. I'll see you in the future.